I didn't see rain clouds when I came in. Um, our morning uh, will be, this morning our first speaker will be Afshin Malavi, um, who is the author of Persian Pilgrimages, Journeys Across Iran. He was nominated for the Thomas Cook Literary Travel Book of the Year, and he is a former Dubai-based correspondent for Reuters News Agency, a regular contributor to the Washington Post from Iran. Mr. Malavi has covered the Middle East and Washington for a wide range of international publications. His articles and op-eds have appeared in the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, the Financial Times, Smithsonian, National Geographic, Business Week, The New Republic, Foreign Policy, The Christian Science Monitor, The Nation, The Journal of Commerce, and The Wilson Quarterly. Among other publications, he comments regularly on Iran and the Middle East on CNN, the BBC, National Public Radio, and other broadcast outlets. Born in Iran but raised and educated in the West, Mr. Malavi holds a master degree in Middle East history and international economics from the Johns Hopkins University of Advanced International Study. He has also worked at the International Finance Corporation, the private sector development arm of the World Bank. So we are very pleased that he's with us early this morning and ready to start our day's program. We mm -hmm. want to thank you for being with us, and we look forward to, um, to your remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the World Affairs Council for, for hosting me and for hosting this uh, very important event. Thank you all for coming, and, and thanks also to uh, the Public Affairs Alliance of Iranian Americans uh, for, uh, I think it's, it's an exciting development in the Iranian American community that this organization uh, has, has been recently formed. Uh, you know, I, I often joke with friends, the trouble with Iran is it's never in the news, right? Um, and uh, and uh, we... Um we uh, and and those of us who are in the field of, of Iran studies and and uh, we, we often joke about how uh, we ought to give some of our honorariums and and, and some of our trips to Ahmadinejad because he keeps uh, um, keeps us very busy. Uh, you probably saw today's uh, front page of the Washington Post. Iran launches nine test missiles. Uh, says more already. Um, interestingly, I spoke with uh, um, a relative yesterday in Tehran uh, on the phone and uh, and he said to me. Can you believe you know what's happening? And I and I, and I said, yeah, you know, it, it's all over the news. And he said, really, it's all over the news. I said, yeah. And and uh, and and you know, he said, well, that's good. And I said, it's good. He said, yeah. You know, they should know how, how high the price of tomatoes have gone up in Iran. You know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that I often found when I was traveling in Iran and reporting from Iran is, is, you know, here in Washington and elsewhere, we tend to think of Iran as a geopolitical entity, as a security challenge, you know, for the United States, whereas, you know, real Iranians are, are thinking about the price of meat and the price of tomatoes and, and more ordinary, you know, mundane things. And in fact, since, you know, we're gathered here with high school teachers, I should tell you that in, when I was in high school, one of my uh, teachers teachers really uh, played a significant role in embarking me on, on a path of studying foreign affairs. Um, and, and one of the reasons uh, I think he made it attractive to me, he was a specialist on China, was he didn't only view China in the prism of American policy and American strategy, but he showed us films from China. He showed us uh, that there are real Chinese living and loving and doing everything that uh, you know we in America do as well. And I think that's somehow missed in, in the coverage uh, of, of Iran um, and how Iran is translated in, in the United States. Now, I'll just give you another example, an interesting anecdote. Uh, I was in my apartment in Tehran. Uh, this was about seven years ago or so. Um, and I was uh, uh, watching uh, the BBC World Service. And on the air came a, uh, a group of young Iranians, uh, a student group that were chanting death to America and death to Israel, kind of the image that, that, that we see regularly. But what, and it was about a 15 to 20 second sound bite. Um, um, when, uh, but what was interesting is I was actually at that rally uh, earlier in the day, and when you you know you extrapolated beyond the 22nd bite, uh, and you actually see what was going on there that day, uh, you'll find some very interesting things. First of all. Uh, what was happening is there was a play that actually never made it to the stage, um, but it was about a uh, it was about a student studying for his college entrance examinations. And in Iran, the college entrance examination is called the concours, and it is 
well, about 10 times as important as the SAT uh, in terms of getting you into college. And so students go out of their way and parents, you know, well-off parents will spend, you know, uh, thousands of dollars on tutors. There was even a, a, a movement uh, uh, to hire gurus and, 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 and psychics to help their um, young uh, um, uh, daughters and sons to uh, score well on these exams. Well, this play that never made it to the stage was a satire on the college entrance examination. Um, and it was essentially a story of a young man studying for the entrance examination and the hidden imam, the, the, the Mahdi, uh, the Messiah figure in Shia Islam who has been in occultation for more than 1100 years showed up at his door and showed up at his door and said, I have returned and I have returned to save the world and I have selected you to join me in saving the world. Now this young man looked at the hidden imam, this extraordinary figure in, in Shia Islam, the Messiah figure, and he looked at his papers and he said, man, I have the concours on Monday, can't we start saving the world on Tuesday? You know? <laughs> And, uh, and and so so the 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 hardliners you know kind of took this and this was this was the moment of President Khatami and the reform uh, movement that was taking place in Iran from roughly 97 through 2003 when when the, the crackdown really began hard on the reformers um, but um, the hardline groups kind of took this and and they used this as an example of the quote unquote vice and the blasphemy that that comes from uh, you know the openings in the press and openings in the media, etc. And so a group of hardline students, about 400 or so, uh, engaged in a, a protest. And this is the protest that I attended. And what was very interesting, however, was you had about a thousand or so students kind of on the periphery of the protest. And I went and I spoke with some of them, and we were speaking in Persian. But when they found out that I work for uh, a foreign newspaper, I was working for the Washington Post at the time, they became angry at me. They said, well, you foreign journalists come and you, you take pictures of these hardliners and you send them back and, and the world thinks we're all, you know, fanatics. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then the other, the, 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 the more interesting aspect of it was when I actually went and spoke with the hardline students uh, afterwards. And, uh, and one of them was kind of, you know, kind of turned the questions on me. Um, and he had some of his friends there, kind of a, uh, a thuggish group, uh, frankly. Um, and, and he said, so where have you come from? And I said, I've come from, you know, Washington. Um, you, know, who, you know, who do you write for? And I write for the Washington Post. Do you do you, you know? Do you carry an American passport? I said yes. I carry an American passport. Um, and you know, his friends kind of gathered around me. And without any hint of embarrassment, this hardliner turns to me and he says, well, "How can I get a green card?" So, <laughs> so, so you, when you have these these hardliners seeking green cards, you know, you know something is up. But but there was you know so much going on behind the scenes of that uh, that 20 second uh, bit that we saw on the BBC. Um, so let me give you. Let me just start by, you know, one question that many people ask is, how did we go from President Mohammed Khatami and the Dialogue of Civilizations to President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and the more hardline, strident uh, tone that we're hearing in Iran today? Um, and I think if we go back to those 2005 elections that brought Mahmoud Ahmadinejad into power, it will give us a, a, a good snapshot of Iranian society, culture, and politics, and, and even where we stand today. Uh, now, it's important to remember that Iranian elections elections are never entirely free and fair. There is a body known as the Guardian's Council, uh, which has the power to vet all candidates for elective office. Um, they can vet uh, um, you on the flimsiest charge uh, uh, without an explanation. They can say you do not have sufficient Islamic knowledge, quote unquote. Um, Interestingly, they've actually vetted candidates uh, um, uh, for the parliament who are already sitting members of parliament, so they passed the Guardian's Council one time, but the Guardian's Council, which is a hardline conservative body, obviously didn't like the voting record, so when it came time for their re-election, they uh, didn't pass them the second time around. So, you know, in these, you know, however, despite the fact that you have these, you know, limited insiders only vetted elections, within those limited insiders only vetted elections, you have real competition. You don't necessarily know who's going to win. Um, it's not like, you know, e Egypt, for example, where you're pretty sure Hosni Mubarak is going to get 99.2% of the vote, you know. Um, uh, so you can actually be surprised in Iranian elections. Uh, and, and, and you can be surprised in the parliamentary elections and in presidential elections. So in the 2005 election, you had eight candidates who emerged 
emerged from this vetting process, uh, one of which was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, after the first round of the voting, you had um, two candidates emerge, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who was the mayor of Tehran at the time, and Hashemi Rafsanjani, who was the former president of Iran. Um, now, in many ways, Hashemi Rafsanjani was the perfect foil to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Hashemi Rafsanjani, to many Iranians, is the epitome of the millionaire mullah. Now, you know, what, one thing that, that is often missed about the Islamic Republic of Iran is that in many ways it has become the Islamic Republic of Iran, Inc. Uh, we don't think that men of the cloth, men of religion, would sully themselves, you know, in business, would get involved in corruption, would, but, but this is exactly what happens. And Rafsanjani, in many ways, to many Iranians, is the embodiment of this. Uh, and so, if you are an Iranian suffering economically, you can point the finger at Hashemi Rafsanjani and his sons. His sons have become, and it's almost become, you know, mythical in a sense. Every new building that pops up in Tehran, Iranians say, oh, that belongs to Rafsanjani and his family. Uh, and you know, it goes so far as, you know, buildings in Canada and Dubai belong to, you know, every new building in Dubai that goes up, people say it belongs to Rafsanjani and his family. Uh, so, so we, you had this, this, this candidate, Ahmadinejad, going up against Rafsanjani. Now, what did Ahmadinejad do in his campaign? He campaigned on a populist platform. When you go back and you, you look at Ahmadinejad's speeches, he said nary a word about Israel, very little about uranium enrichment, very little about foreign policy. Ahmadinejad's campaign was a purely populist campaign, speaking out against the corruption of the ruling elite. Uh, and, and when he spoke about the corruption of the ruling elite, he often, it was implied that he meant people like Rafsanjani. And he also promised economic deliverance to uh, Iran's poor. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that was happening from this 97 through 2005 period is Iranians did have greater spaces uh, for uh, political pluralism. There was a relative opening of the press. But the economic conditions of Iranians had not markedly improved. Uh, and in fact, Iranians were still suffering from chronic inflation uh, and stagnant wages. Ahmadinejad came forward and interestingly borrowed a page from Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini in the late 1970s, in the run-up to the revolution, talked about distributing the oil wealth to the people's tablecloth. Uh, he even talked about oil checks delivered to your door. And, and when I talk to Iranians uh, uh, who uh, you know, took part in the revolution, particularly working class uh, Iranians, they actually said, I remember what Khomeini said. And that was you know, what led me to you know, support this revolution. You know, these, these economic issues, I think, are often you know, overlooked. Uh, and so uh, we had this, this uh, um, uh, Rafsanjani versus Ahmadinejad in this environment of reformist failure. We had this period from 1997 through 2005. When President Mohammad Khatami was, was uh, elected, you had in 99, 1999 a reformist parliament elected. There was excitement in the air. I remember the, the newspapers at the time, uh, you know, the, the, the newspaper vendor was the most popular man in town. Everyone was rushing to buy the latest uh, uh, reformist papers. This was before a heavy crackdown began on the papers. And, and just to give you kind of an example of what happens in Iran's system. Uh, in the Khatami era, for example, you had the president and who appoints his cabinet ministers. Um, and so his cabinet ministers were uh, um, generally people who were aligned with him. Uh, um, one of the ministers uh, at the time of the judiciary was a holdover from the previous uh, presidency. Uh, well, what would happen is the minister of culture would grant licenses to newspapers to open. These newspapers that tended to be the reformist uh, uh, type would print and publish and, and, and they would really touch on subjects that were formerly considered taboo from Iran's relations with the United States to you know the, the issue of whether women should be forced to wear the uh, Islamic uh, veil. Uh, and what would happen is the judiciary would close down the paper. Uh, and then the, uh, the, 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 those editors would go back to the Minister of Culture and, and ask for another license. And they would get the license again. And the judiciary would close down the paper, you know, again a few weeks later. And this cat and mouse game would take place until eventually the judiciary would jail 
the journalists. Uh, and and uh, the joke was that uh, there were so many uh, journalists in, in, in Evin prison that the, that the best newspaper was the Evin Daily News, you know, uh, in, in Iran. And, and one uh, Iranian journalist um, put it to me best. He said, he said, we don't have a problem with freedom of speech. We have a problem with freedom after speech. Uh, and, um, and so, so these, were the, these were the kind of things that were going on, you know, in that era. So, 2005 elections roll around. People who were formerly excited about the reformists had grown disillusioned. So you had a massive cohort of Iranians who chose not to participate in the 2005 elections. So, in, even in the height of the reformist victories, in, in 97, 99, and 2000 in municipal elections, the conservative base managed to get about 20 to 25 percent of the vote. Well, now imagine a scenario where you have 20 million Iranians who choose not to vote. Um, you have uh, a great deal of reformist, uh, you have a great deal of disillusion, uh, and then you have a candidate like Rafsanjani who doesn't excite too many people. Uh, people were voting for him kind of as a vote against Ahmadinejad. And then you had a candidate like Ahmadinejad who managed to excite uh, working class, uh, uh, rural, um, uh, and uh, working class urban Iranians. So Ahmadinejad uh, managed to uh, win uh, victory in the 2005 elections. Well, since he's come into power, he hasn't delivered uh, really on any of his economic promises. Uh, Iranians are suffering from higher inflation today uh, than they were before he came into power. Uh, Iran's uh, economic management um, is, is, is a story, is one of the great untold stories of Iran is the economic decline of Iran since the 1979 revolution. This is a country with the world's second largest gas reserves, the world's third largest oil reserves, uh, and yet it's number 102 on the United Nations Human Development Index. Uh, you have uh, um, you know, widespread unemployment, underemployment. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I would get into a, a taxi and, and the driver would be a professor, the driver would be a teacher, the driver would be someone in the military. Uh, people are having really a difficult time uh, making ends meet uh, with uh, the, the, the inflation and the stagnant wages that they're facing. Um, so, uh, you know, when you look at, say, Iranian society today, um, you know, I, you know, it's very important. One of the first things that, that you notice that is that it's young. Um, Two-thirds of Iranians are under the age of 32. Half are under the age of 21. When you think about this for a moment, this means about 50 million of Iran's 70 million people were uh, either unborn or were unwitting children at the time of the 1979 revolution. Uh, and, and, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini, um, after the revolution, called for Iranians to go forth and procreate, uh, in a sense. And uh, so, so, the, so there would be a, the vanguard of the future Islamic revolution. Well, to some extent this happened, uh, and, uh, and it had a lot more to do with the fact that family planning programs were cut back um, uh, after this period. And, uh, and, and you did have this baby boom. Well, actually, this young population um, has not become the vanguard of the revolution. It has become uh, really a potential threat to uh, the, the future of the Iranian revolution. Because they, they are by and large, and this is, you know, from my own visits to 20 cities and villages across Iran, you, you get the sense that the young people in Iran are by and large disenchanted, uh, frustrated, disillusioned. And, and this is a key point. They're not, uh, you know, all as hyper-politicized as we sometimes think they are. Because when we see young people on the television, we see pro-democracy students, you know, chanting slogans, for example, against the government. But what I found is young people simply longing for normalcy, uh, longing for a decent job, a decent life, uh, as, you know, some you know semblance of, of freedom, some semblance of social freedoms. Uh, and this is the thing that, that would, I would come back to over and over again in my conversations with them. And I also found them to be more pragmatic than their parents' generation. The 1970s generation of Iranian students, in particular, on campuses were really imbued with sort of the third worldist, leftist, uh, utopianist, uh, you know, ideas of that era. Uh, um, and, and many of them, when you talk to them and you ask them who their heroes were, you know, they, they would uh, list figures like Che Guevara. Uh, they, they were, uh, you know, one of the things that, that is often missed about the 1979 revolution is that 
uh, without the presence of the communist coup de party uh, in Iran, uh, it would have been very difficult for, in my view, for the revolution to succeed. Uh, you know, people often say to me, well, if Iranians are so disenchanted today, why isn't there another revolution? You know, in 1979, you had a unique confluence of circumstances come together, a once in a, you know, several generation confluence of circumstances. You had a, uh, a leader, the, the Shah of Iran, who was weak and indecisive and stricken with cancer. Uh, you had, but, but more importantly, you had a broad uh, cross-section of groups that were agitating against the Shah. You had nationalists, uh, you had intellectuals, you had Islamists, uh, and you had, uh, very importantly, communist uh, to the party members uh, who were all agitating against the Shah, and as well as the bazaar merchants, um, uh, which were in many ways bankrolling you know, aspects of the revolution. And all of this came together um, at the same time and led to the overthrow of the Shah. Well, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that people uh, uh, sometimes misses that this idea that the Islamic Republic was inevitable, this idea of rule by clerics was inevitable. Well, actually, when Ayatollah Khomeini came forward with this idea of rule by the clergy, he was not even accepted by the senior Ayatollahs uh, in Iran. Uh, because for, before Ayatollah Khomeini, for 1,000 years, the classical Shia view was that the clerics should never rule the state. Uh, clerics may get involved in advising rulers, but, but clerics cannot sully themselves, pollute themselves by entering the arena of politics. But what Ayatollah Khomeini did is upend that idea. He said, he argued, in the absence of the hidden imam, this same hidden imam who came to that student in this, in this play, in the absence of the hidden imam, the, the, those who are the representatives of the hidden imam on earth, i.e. the clerics, who have the most knowledge of Islam, ought to be the rulers of the state. Well, uh, as I said, the senior Ayatollahs did not agree with this, and when uh, the revolution uh, succeeded, often in these revolutionary conditions, it's often not the ones necessarily with the most powerful ideas who come out on top. It's the ones who are willing to use guns, the ones who are, in the words of one diplomat, the ones who are willing to throw acid on their opponents' faces, frankly. Um, and, and this is, you know, really what happened in the post, you know, revolutionary maelstrom. Interestingly, an interesting side note, the, the hostage-taking. Um, the hostage-taking was mostly uh, driven by uh, the leftist um, uh, the, uh, and the hard left in Iran who were complaining that the new government in Iran, the, the Islamic revolutionary government, was too soft on America, uh, and a group of students who were affiliated with this Islamist uh, group said, okay, you think we're soft on America? Here, let's, you know, we'll show you it's just being soft on America. And if you may recall the images of Ahmadinejad that came out, you know, was he or was he not a hostage taker? Well, I, I have interviewed several of the hostage takers, um, and they said to me that Ahmadinejad was not one of us. In fact, Ahmadinejad wanted to take the Soviet embassy hostage. Uh, he didn't want to. He didn't want to take the American embassy hostage. So, so uh, let me just briefly go over a couple of other things. I think it, it may be interesting to you to learn what Iranians are watching and reading, and you know some aspects of you know pop culture in Iran. Um, uh, the most popular movie. Uh, in Iran, uh, in the post-revolution uh, period, it's a very interesting film. It was a film called Marmulak, and it was a satire of Iran's clerical uh, class. It was very interesting that it actually made it to the uh, screen. You know, one of the things about Iran is Iran today is not Saddam Hussein's Iraq or, you know, Hafez Assad, Syria. It is a place where you can actually, you have these spaces in which artists can operate, um, in which um, filmmakers can operate. But again, uh, going back to what the journalist said, the, the problem is not freedom of speech, it's freedom after speech. Uh, and, and, and in this case, this film was shut down after four weeks uh, um, uh, run in the cinema. Let me just give you a brief synopsis of the film, uh, because it's interesting. Uh, you had a guy who was a petty thief. Uh, he was thrown into jail for his latest uh, con. Uh, and, uh, and while in jail, he got into a fight. Um, in the fight, he got injured, and he was uh, taken to the infirmary. Um, uh, while there, there was a cleric who was also hospitalized. And since he was hospitalized, he had to take off his clerical robes. Um, while the cleric was asleep, 
this thief managed to uh, slip into his clerical robes and walk out of the hospital um, with a great deal of respect. And people were saying, you know, um, you know, good day, uh, you know, Hajar, which is, a, is kind of a, a, an honorific for, for the cleric. Um, and it kind of, you know, it, as with all comedies, there was a unique, uh, um, you know, a circumstance of events that led him to be the uh, cleric at a small village. Uh, and, and, and this small village, the, the seminary, the, the, the gatherings were fairly small. Um, but he suddenly managed to attract more and more people because he was not obviously a cleric. But what he did offer them was common sense wisdom. Uh, and, and interestingly, he, was, he would do things like he would tell young people, it's okay to have a little fun. He would quote Quentin Tarantino, uh, the film director. Um, and, uh, and it got to a point where he became kind of this rock star mullah. Uh, who, who was attracting, you know, uh, admirers and followers from all over. Now, this was obviously a, a satire of Iran's clerical class, showing how out of touch they are with the realities of ordinary Iranians if this petty thief and con man can, can put on clerical robes and become so popular in such a short period of time. Well, this film, you know, made it to, uh, uh, it was standing room only, you couldn't get seats uh, uh, for this film in the cinema, it had a four week run, uh, after, its biggest crime might have been its popularity, uh, uh, you know, the authorities started realizing, hey, something is up here, you know, there's some real crowds going to this film, and they probably took a look at the film, and, and that's when they shut it down. Then they shut it down, and it appeared on the DVD market, but on the open DVD market, um, and then that was being sold, and you know, made a lot of money and then they shut that down and then it started appearing on the underground DVD market um, and and so that was you know one of the most popular films in, in post uh, Islamic Republic history um, this idea this notion that clerics are losing popularity is one that is very commonly uh, um, uh, understood in Iran and even commonly understood among clerics um, one of the most visible sites and, and one of the things that you will see uh, if you go to Iran which I hope you do um, um, uh, at some point, is the, the cleric uh, standing on the side of the street waiting for a taxi. Uh, this, you know, I saw this myself several times, uh, because often taxis will not pick them up. Um, and I was in one of these taxis where, where it was a, a straight line taxi, um, which means it picks people up along the way. Uh, and, and so it's a kind of a cheaper way to go from point A to point B. And there were two seats empty, and the taxi driver kind of stopped about 20 meters in front of where the cleric was standing. And as the cleric walked up to the door, uh, the taxi driver gunned it and, you know, and left him you know, in the dust. Now, I was the only one who saw a problem with this. Everybody else in the car was saying, good job. You know, and and they, there's this Persian phrase that these guys have eaten enough, it's time for them to run a little, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, so, but you know, I, you know but the, the trouble was that that cleric, you know, on the side of the street was obviously not a government-affiliated cleric, because if he was, he probably would have been in a Mercedes or in a, you know, in a nice car being chauffeured from place to place. And this is the important point to remember, that it just, going back to my point about 1979, uh, to, to this day, the vast majority of clerics in Iran are not affiliated to the government. Uh, and, uh, and there is a movement within the seminary uh, that is uh, opposed uh, to uh, clerical rule, and opposed in particular to the current ruler, uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who uh, does not have the religious credentials of, frankly, someone like Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, and he was elevated to his post uh, in 1988 uh, after um, you know, we don't have time to probably get into all the details of this, but essentially Ayatollah Khomeini had a successor. Uh, his name was Ayatollah Ali Montazeri, a, a prominent cleric, serious religious credentials, but Montazeri disagreed with Ayatollah Khomeini on several issues, uh, to the point where Ayatollah Khomeini dismissed him. Uh, and this is, again, something that clerics cannot do. They cannot dismiss each other, they cannot, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini even went so far as to defrock a cleric. But in the clerical system, you know, where people operate by consensus and, and, and you know, very delicate notions of hierarchy, uh, these are things that are unheard of. So an Islamic philosopher by the name of Abdul Karim Surush has developed, developed a popularity in the mid-1990s because he began a, uh, a very vigorous and sophisticated 
sophisticated uh, program of writing um, and speaking, um, arguing that the that the mingling of religion and politics uh, pollutes the faith and hampers politics. He essentially argues that you know religion involves sacred truths, politics involves malleable truths, um, and 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 therefore uh, you know by uh, by mingling sacred truths in politics, you veer towards fascism. Um, and this is what Sarouche had been arguing, and he's developed you know a following in the seminary. Um, and then um, just lastly, how are we doing on time? I should probably wrap up, huh? Okay. Just just lastly on the the. Uh, uh, um, Iranians and Americans. I think this is this is an issue that a lot of people are uh, interested in. Um, you know, in, shortly after 9/11, um, uh, the the only place in the Middle East where there was a spontaneous candlelight vigil, spontaneous gathering of 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 people commemorating the victims of 9-11 um, was in Iran, in Tehran, uh, at my, uh, just outside my apartment in, in Tehran. Uh, and, and what happened when these five or six thousand people gathered, and by the way, they were chanting death to the Taliban um, shortly after this, uh, a group of hardline thugs associated with the government came in and started whacking them and beating them up because they didn't want these images to go out across the airwaves. They didn't want people to see that Iranians were sympathetic to you know, the American uh, victims of 9-11 in this spontaneous way. Um, the, other, the other interesting uh, point, um, and then I'll get to my own anecdotal, uh, but the other interesting point is in 2002, uh, an a, a Iranian pollster, an Iranian pollster, a polling group that was actually had done very good polling in the past, polled Iranians and they said, uh, they asked them, would you like your country to restore relations with the United States? 75% uh, of the Iranians said yes. Uh, and as a result, those pollsters were thrown in jail. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, and f for a moment, you get a taste of the irony here because one of the pollsters uh, was a hostage taker. Uh, and, uh, and, and he was one of these hostage takers turned reformers who then set up this polling uh, establishment um, and, and after this poll came out, uh, he was thrown in jail by the authorities. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that not only I, but many American journalists who visited Iran um, have, have seen is that, is that Iran is probably one of the most pro-American populations in the Middle East. Populations, again, not governments. Uh, you know, Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times saw it when he went. Uh, Thomas Friedman saw it. You know, journalists, when they go back to, when they go to Iran, they, they can't believe how, you know, open Iranians are to Americans. Uh, um, and this is not to say that they embrace American foreign policy, but, but Americans in general. Uh, you know, I think Bernard Lewis, the scholar of Middle East studies at Princeton University, probably put it well when he said that there's an inverse proportionality. The closer your government is to the United States, the more anti-American the population tends to be. Um, the, the more antagonistic your government is to the United States, the more pro-American the population tends to be. I found this to be true in my own travels across the region. I find it far more strident anti-American sentiment in Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Iran than our, our close, sorry, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, sorry, and Jordan are close allies than in Iran. Um, uh, just another, you know, anecdotally, I also found this to be the case. There was a group of Dutch cyclists that I met um, and that were biking across Iran along with an American. And, uh, and, and they traveled all across Iran. It was really an extraordinary journey. They should have had a documentary film crew with them. Uh, and, but uh, one of the things that they told me is everywhere they went, um, the, uh, uh, the Dutch, you know, Iranians are known for their hospitality. Um, they will, you know, take uh, strangers into their homes. They will take them, uh, offer them, you know, food. And I had it, several occasions in my own travels um, in which people insisted that I stay at their homes, etc. Um, and, and so these, these cyclists uh, uh, were amazed at the hospitality, but the Dutch cyclists said that it's not fair because everywhere we go, the, you know, we say we're from Holland and we get, you know, uh, 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 we, we're hospitable towards us, but when the guy says he's from America, he's embraced and, and, and uh, they go out of their way to embrace him. And it got to a point where the Dutch cyclists started saying that we're from America too, you know. And, uh, <laughs> 
and you don't you don't find that too often in the Middle East. Uh, so just to sum up, so ultimately, what do we have in Iran? Um, we do have a foreign policy challenge, a clear foreign policy challenge, and and I didn't even get into the nuclear issue. I didn't get into the the the, the, uh, the ballistic missile tests, and I'm sure we can talk about that in the the discussion uh, section. But we also have a soft power challenge, not just the hard power challenge. Is and the soft power challenge is how to maintain um, uh, this relatively pro-American Iranian populace in the face of this, you know, antagonistic relations uh, between the two governments. And 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 I think to to, 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 to some extent the, the somewhat flippant way in which American uh, politicians talk about the possibility of inflicting uh, violence uh, on Iran. Um, we have a large and strategically vital country. What Ronald Reagan said um, uh, several years ago remains true when he said Iran occupies some of the most critical geography on Earth, uh, the Persian Gulf, where 40% of the world's oil passes through, where 60% of the world's oil reserves uh, are. Iran, uh, you know, borders uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so, in a sense, Iran and the United States have become uh, uh, neighbors um, uh, because of those borders. Um, we have a, a country with deep historical roots, uh, um, and, and a country with deep historical roots, um, and, and, and a population that, that lives with those uh, deep historical roots uh, every day. Uh, and then we have this young, dynamic population hungry for change. Uh, we have a highly urbanized country with high levels of literacy, fairly good universities, um, and as a result, a high rate of brain drain. Uh, you know, something like you know, Iran's Minister of Education said that 200,000 Iranians leave the country uh, each year, 200,000 college-educated Iranians leave the country each year uh, because of the lack of jobs. Um, you know, and then we have rulers who are repressive, who abuse uh, Iranians. Uh, you know, I often say that the Iranian rulers are probably more dangerous to the Iranian people uh, than they are to the region. Um, they are repressive, and they are, you know, incredibly bad stewards of the economy. This is, as I said, this is this. You know, Iran's economic woes are taking place amid historically high oil prices, uh, and, and at a time when Iran's Persian Gulf neighbors are booming. Um, so these are, you know, bad stewards of the economy. Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, uh, I think it was well put by an Iranian, uh, sorry, European diplomat who said that the Iranian state at some point is going to have to decide whether it wants to be a country or a cause. Um, uh, I think the vast majority of Iranians want it to be a country, and I, I, don't, I don't think the rulers have decided um, uh, either way yet, and they're still torn between being a country or a cause. Thank you very much. Well, we will have um, time for questions and answers. And please wait for the mic if you have a question. 